Uh, for moving our movement forward. And so, Naomi, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Sean. You've been such an incredible ally and help and advisor on this project for so many years, and I'm, I'm so grateful. Bonsoir à tous. Uh, je suis très désolée qu'on parle en anglais ce soir, uh, la prochaine fois en français. It is a true honor to share this stage with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and this platform um, with a really terrific panel who you are going to hear from next. Um, it's, it's wonderful, too, to have this space to focus on the absolutely critical role of the trade union movement in fighting and winning climate justice. So we, uh, I want to talk a little bit um, about what we can expect from the official negotiations going on at Le Bourget. Um, the deal that will be unveiled in less than a week, likely to much fanfare and self-congratulation from politicians echoed in, by an overly deferential press, will not be enough to keep us safe. In fact, it will be extraordinarily dangerous. We know from doing the math and adding up the targets that the major economies have brought to Paris, that those targets lead us to a very dangerous future. They lead us to a future of between three and four degrees Celsius warming. These are figures from the Tyndall Center and Kevin Anderson who have analyzed those numbers. It does not lead us to two degrees Celsius, which is what many of our governments pledged to do in Copenhagen in 2009. In 2009, dangerous warming was defined um, as anything above two degrees Celsius in a document known as the Copenhagen Accord. When a draft of that document was leaked um, to the convention center in Copenhagen, the Bella Center, African delegates marched through the halls of the convention center and called it a death sentence for Africa. And the island, low-lying island states, held demonstrations uh, chanting 1.5 to survive. We also know from leading climate scientists like James Hansen that two degrees is just too high. Indeed, we know from lived experience that the amount we have already warmed the globe is too much. We are already living the era of dangerous warming. It is already costing thousands of lives and livelihoods, from the Philippines to Bangladesh to Nigeria to New Orleans and the Marshall Islands. I could go on and on. But it's important to understand that language matters and that we, when we speak about dangerous warming as something that is far off in the distance, it is nothing, nothing less than, as my friend Kumi Naidu put it yesterday, subliminal racism. And that racism is getting less subliminal every day. We are discounting lives when we speak that way, and we have to stop doing it. <clears throat> so given this context, we know that the deal that will be unveiled um, at the end of the week, on the weekend, is going to steamroll over crucial scientific red lines. We also know from the paltry levels of financing that wealthy governments have brought to the table that it is also going to steamroll over equity red lines, which means that wealthy countries um, that have been emitting fossil fuels on an industrial scale for a couple hundred years will continue to fail to do our fair share of emission reductions, sharing the atmospheric space, failing to share it, and we will continue to pay our fair share for the impacts of that, for loss and damage caused by climate change, and also the resources that are badly needed so that poorer countries can leapfrog over fossil fuels and the car culture and go directly to renewable energy, 
community-controlled renewable energy, energy democracy, which is viable, as we're seeing in countries like Bangladesh, um, and also uh, leapfrog over car culture and go to modern uh, renewable-based public transit. It takes resources and technology transfers to happen. We also know that it's going to steamroll over our legal red lines because the U.S. has come to these negotiations announcing that the deal cannot be legally binding. Any talk of penalties was off the table before it even began. Um, which is why on December the 12th at 12 o'clock, that's 12, 12, 12, many activists will be in the streets of Paris peacefully demonstrating against the violation of these red lines. We will also... We will also be mourning the lives already lost to climate disruption, in solidarity with the lives lost to the tragic attacks here in Paris, and enlarging that circle of mourning. By taking to the streets, we will be clearly and unequivocally rejecting the Hollande government's draconian and opportunistic bans on marches, protests, and demonstrations. We will be rejecting the shameful preemptive arrests of climate activists, the unprecedented restrictions on civil society inside the COP, the restrictions on free speech and movement, because liberté is not just a word, and it doesn't just apply to Christmas markets and football matches. Indeed, it mean, indeed it means nothing if it does not apply to political dissent and the defense of life on Earth. This climate disobedience does not make us insensitive. It does not make us hooligans. It is our sacred duty to those suffering in the present day and who stand to lose so much if we fail in this race against time for climate justice. And let me also say this. I hope that the trade union movement and that workers in this city will stand with us on December 12th because the right to assemble, the right to dissent is central to all of our movements and all of our victories, past and future. Parce que la liberté n'est pas qu'un mot, c'est un devoir, un qu'on doit défendre ensemble et la solidarité aussi. Yet as we join together to reject the dangerous world being offered by those inside Le Bourget, as well as by the corporations who finance those politicians, we must also, as Jeremy said so eloquently, do more than just say no. We must say yes, yes to the world we want. We need to paint a picture of what life could look like inside those red lines, life within the limits imposed on us by nature. And that life needs to not just be better than a future of climate catastrophe. It needs to be better than the present, a present of catastrophic levels of austerity, deepening inequality, and rising racism, as we just saw with the elections here in France. That is our task, and Jeremy Corbyn rightly describes the challenge we face as, in large part, a crisis of imagination. So I want to spend some time sharing an experience um, that I have been privileged to participate in in my home country of Canada, where um, last May a group of us, uh, 60 organizers, um, leaders, theorists, from movements representing labor, climate, migrant rights, anti-poverty, food justice, women's rights, housing rights, you pretty much name it, um, came together to do something that we very rarely do, and that is to dream together. Uh, we kind of hauled up together for two days. It wasn't um, you know, a conference where everyone was making speeches. In fact, there were no speeches at all. But we had really intensive workshops, 
And we tried to sketch out what it would look like to live in a future that respected both natural limits and human rights and human needs. And we came up with a document that Sean referenced uh, called the LEAP Manifesto, which you can read in, I think, nine languages uh, at leapmanifesto.org. And um, since we launched it in September, it has been signed by 100 Canadian organizations, um, everyone from Black Lives Matter, Toronto, to Oxfam, which are not usually groups that you know, come together um, uh, necessarily uh, in coalition. We have the largest trade union movement, uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. We also have Greenpeace Canada and 350.org. Um, it's also been signed by Leonard Cohen and Ellen Page and tens of thousands of of Canadians. I always tell people, I know Canadian celebrity sounds like an oxymoron, but we have all five. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it was this extraordinary uh, experience of, uh, of saying yes. And we launched it in the, middle, in the middle of an election campaign precisely because we felt that none of the major parties that had a chance of winning the election were either um, putting climate change at the center of their campaigns, or when they were talking about climate change, doing so in a way that respected the science, which in Canada really crucially means that we need to keep the vast majority of the Alberta tar sands in the ground. And because that became unsayable during the election, um, we decided to say it. Um, and just insert it into the debate at a time when people were talking about politics, which is what they do during election campaigns. And this process has inspired similar manifestos, similar gathering processes everywhere from Nunavut to Australia. So at the heart of it is the argument that if we take the imperative to rapidly build a post-carbon economy seriously, we have a once in a century opportunity to transform our economy for the better, to make it fairer, um, to, to heal centuries old wounds, to turn the world right side up. And, um, and so we tried to figure out how we could do that, how we could build an economy with more good unionized jobs that pay a living wage, with better public services that are more equitably distributed. Um, but you know, before I get into the nitty gritty of the Leap Manifesto, I just wanna talk a little bit personally about what brought me to this. Jeremy mentioned Hurricane Katrina, and I, I was in New Orleans while it was still underwater because I was writing the shock doctrine at the time. And New Orleans became you know, a pretty classic example of what I meant by the shock doctrine. But it was also my education um, in how we can't really understand the threat of climate change unless we understand um, that this crisis has hit us at the worst possible moment in human evolution, and that moment being the neoliberal era, right? Because what happened in New Orleans was a collision between heavy weather um, and weak infrastructure, right? New Orleans, uh, uh, Katrina was a heavy storm. It was a big storm, but it had actually been downgraded from a Category 5 hurricane to a tropical storm by the time it hit New Orleans. The levees should have held, but because that infrastructure had been allowed to decay despite many warnings, like so much public infrastructure, they collapsed and the city flooded. And then the people of New Orleans, the people who need there to be a functioning state on some level, confronted what, what the economist Paul Krugman describes as the can't-do state which meant that no level of government was able to, to do anything, to organize a basic evacuation, um, to get food and water to the thousands who were stranded in the Superdome. Um, and then came the shock doctrine um, after the shock. So, I mean, what was extraordinary was that despite the fact that this was um, a failure, that the, the catastrophe was created by the failure of the public sphere. That did not stop the Republican Party and the think tanks um, behind it to push for the further decimation of the public sphere. So public housing was demolished, um, pub the public school system was turned into the most privatized school system in the United States. New Orleans now has, I think 96% of the schools in New Orleans are now what are called charter schools, privately um, run. Uh, the major public hospital serving low-income people, which means African-American people in New Orleans, was never reopened, it's still not reopened. 
opened. And obviously layered on top of this is racism um, and the fact that the, uh, the people who were left behind were overwhelmingly African American and were vilified relentlessly in the press, called looters, called um, refugees within their own country. So this is what climate change looks like under our current system. It's important to understand this when we say system change, not climate change, right? Because this is what climate change looks like under our current system. And it isn't just about things getting hotter and wetter, it's about things getting meaner, right? And we can't let that happen. So, but, you know, what, what, knew, what, what Katrina taught me was how all of these issues are interconnected. Um, because the public sphere, obviously, as Jeremy said, is, um, it, it is, our, is our first line of defense when it comes to dealing with the, with the impacts of climate change. And as Jeremy also mentioned, the UK is experiencing this right now with flooding. And it happened in 2013 um, when, when those, when those uh, British floods happened. And I have a section in This Changes Everything about this because it is so extraordinary that since 2009, Cameron had um, um, uh, laid off thousands of workers at the Environment Agency, which is the agency tasked with dealing with floods. In 2012, The Guardian revealed that nearly 300 flood defense schemes across England had been left unbuilt due to government budget cuts, right? Um, so, you know, this is a very clear example of how the logic of austerity is completely incompatible um, with what we need to do in the face of just the impacts of climate change, let alone getting off fossil fuels, which requires you know, a whole other level of investments um, in energy and transit and so on. And this is why you know, I think anti-austerity parties should be talking about climate change all the time. And I'm amazed that this isn't happening, that Syriza and Podemos you know, don't wait until there's a UN summit to talk about climate change, um, but much of the rest of the time act as if first we have to deal with an economic crisis, and first we have to deal with austerity, and then we can deal with climate change. These are the same crises. Jeremy mentioned, you know, quoted the IMF talking about how dangerous climate change is, and in fact, the head of the IMF is constantly saying about how we're all going to be fried and grilled and roasted. She likes comparing us to chickens. Um, but this is the same IMF that is prescribing relentless austerity on southern Europe, which means that, that supports for renewables have been cut, decimated in Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. It means that public transit fares are going up. It means that rail systems are being privatized. It means that Italy is planning to double the amount of oil that is drilled off its coast. It means that Greece is under pressure to drill for oil and gas. And you know, there's a push for fracking all over Europe, and precisely because of the endless budget crisis and the logic of austerity. It is not hard to make these connections, and we have to do a much better job of doing it. Um, So in the LEAP Manifesto, we have these key demands. We need to invest in our decaying public infrastructure so that it can withstand increasingly frequent extreme weather events. That's pretty obvious. And we also call for all of those obvious investments in energy efficiency, you know, in, in renewable-based uh, renewable transit and rail and so on that we know create up to 10 times more jobs than investments in oil and gas. But we do something else, and I, this is actually, I think, the most important part of the manifesto, which is that we call for more than green jobs in disaster response and putting up solar panels. We're also calling for a wave of investments in the low carbon workforce that is already out there. Okay, What we're trying to do is redefine what is a climate job. It is not just guys in hard hats putting up solar panels. Um, it's that too, but we have to expand those sectors that are already low carbon, caregiving, teaching, social work, healthcare, the arts, public interest media. You know, environmentalists 
don't usually mention it, but teaching and caring for kids doesn't burn much carbon, neither does caring for the sick. Um, so when we care for each other, we are also caring for the earth. And it's important, we can expand these parts of our economy. They can be the, the fastest growing parts of our economy, but at the same time, we do need to contract extraction. We can't do it all. We need to contract those parts of our economy that are based on extraction and mindless consumption, and we need to expand those parts of our economy that are based on caring for the earth and caring for one another. The other thing that we make very clear is that austerity is a manufactured crisis at war with life on earth, that the money that we need is out there, we just have to go after it. It's obvious, it's an end to fossil fuel subsidies um, that will give us trillions of dollars right there, financial transaction taxes, increases on fossil fuel royalties, higher income taxes on corporations and the wealthy, a progressive carbon tax, and by the way, it's a very good time to introduce one when the price of oil is down and cuts to military spending. So this is the task. <clears throat> You know, this project in part was inspired by our work with a great um, Bay, Bay Area group called Movement uh, Generation. And when I did an event with them in Oakland, uh, I spoke alongside a great food justice organizer named Quentin Sankofa. And he stood up and he said, transition is inevitable, justice is not. Justice is the part we have to fight for, right? That if we want the jobs to be good unionized jobs, we have to fight for them. You know, California, 4,000 of California's 10,000 firefighters, front lines of the climate crisis, are prison inmates. They're saving California a billion dollars a year. That's what climate injustice looks like. That's what climate change looks like under the logic of austerity. If we want something else, we are going to have to fight for it, and we're going to have to fight for it together. Trade deals, we'll talk about that. We can't have those either. Um, you know, when we make these connections, because you know, uh, Jeremy talked about Germany, and, and this is you know, a great example of energy democracy, the fact that Germany's created 400,000 jobs. Um, you know, in the Leap Manifesto, we call for energy democracy, but we do something else too, which is um, you know, we, we call for energy justice and something that I would even call energy reparations, which is based on the fact that uh, fossil fuels, uh, having our economies built on fossil fuels has always required sacrifice zones and sacrificial people. People and places have been sacrificed so that our economies could be powered by fossil fuels. And those are the communities, indigenous communities, communities of color that are dealing with the cancer and the asthma um, of the fossil fuel-based economy that need to be first in line for public money to own and control their own renewable energy projects. All right. Trade deals. Yeah, I mentioned trade deals because Germany, um, you know, Jeremy's absolutely right. Germany has been reversing energy privatizations. Hundreds of cities and, town and towns have taken their energy grids back um, because they want to get to 100% uh, renewables is one of the reasons they're doing it. Um, and now a big Swedish uh, company is suing the German government under one of these investor right clauses for 4.7% billion euros. It's one of the biggest such trade challenges. And there are dozens of them where good green policies are being challenged using various trade deals. The US has challenged China and India at the World Trade Organization. Keep this in mind, because while these politicians all point the fingers at each other at summits like this about you're not doing enough, you're not ambitious enough, it's your fault, no, it's your fault, these same governments then go to the World Trade Organization and try to knock down each other's windmills. It is insane, and it has to stop. So. I think, you know, I think the moment for this kind of, tra uh, of transformative moment um, is really now. We have the stars aligning for it. One of them, I mentioned already, the price of oil is down. That makes it a very good moment to impose a carbon tax. It also means um, that certain high-risk projects are no longer as profitable, so there's less of a frenzy to get into places like the Alberta tar sands and into the Arctic. We don't know how long this will last, but it gives us a little bit of breathing room. In the Leap Manifesto, we should say, we say instead of seeing this as a crisis, as our politicians see the drop in oil 
prices. We should see it as a gift because it allows us a moment to pause, look in the mirror, and say we want to change course. Because when oil is at $100 a barrel, people make so much money that they just can't think. Um, so the other thing that's you know, in our favor is that the price of renewables is dropping so quickly. Uh, that price of solar has dropped by 75% in six years. It's now on par with fossil fuels um, in many parts of the world, but we still need those supports and we still no need those technology transports. The other reason why this moment is so ripe is that the climate movement and specifically the climate justice movement is on a roll. We are winning serious victories against the Keystone XL pipeline the Kayactivists, <laughs> um, I think had a little something to do with, uh, with, with Shell's decision to pull out of the Alaskan Arctic for the foreseeable future and Statoil's decision just a couple of weeks ago uh, to do the same. Um, you know, in the Leap Manifesto, we call um, for no new fossil fuel infrastructure. It's time to build the next economy now. And I would just add that I also think it's important to let go of the idea um, that carbon capture and storage is some sort of panacea. Um, we need to build the next economy now, not these very expensive ways of protecting business as usual. I am out of time. Just as we are out of time. Friends, time is short. This is our historical moment. Jeremy, I take your election as leader of the Labour Party as a sign that many are ready to seize this moment in your country and around the world. Let us not disappoint because the stakes are simply too high. Now is not the time for small steps. Now is the time for boldness. Now is the time to leap. Thank you.